Tom. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Wigmore Hall. There's a change in the order of the programme tonight. So we start with Zemlinski and then Schumann, and the Argento is in the second half. So um, if you haven't got a programme, it won't make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> if you have, just flick through to find the Schumann pieces later on in the programme. Now, tonight is being live streamed on our uh, website, so you are all taking part. So with that in mind, please double check mobile phones and no coughing, of course, please. Um, and during the interval, there was a 90 minute clip which is being played telling you about the, the concert. And so you could try and watch it during the interval if you're lucky and get on the Wi-Fi. Um, otherwise, look at it later on and it will be there forever and ever. So you can go back and look at that. So double check mobile phones now and last cough, please. Thank you. <laughs>
for Clara from her beloved husband, Robert. Songs by Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots. Such a sad life, so often retold. There's Schiller's play, of course, but also one of our favorites, Walter Scott. Her face, her form, have been so deeply impressed upon the imagination that even at the distance of nearly three centuries, it is unnecessary to remind the reader of the striking traits which characterize that remarkable countenance. That brow, so truly open and regal, those eyebrows so regularly graceful, which seem to utter a thousand histories, the nose with all its Grecian precision of outline, the mouth so well proportioned, so sweetly formed, the stately swan-like neck, form a countenance the like of which we know not to have existed in any other character moving in that high class of life. Mary did not want to say goodbye to France after her first husband died. It was said that she watched the disappearing shoreline for hours with tears in her eyes exclaiming, farewell, dear France, you disappear from my sight. It is all over. Farewell, sweet France. I shall see you never more. Adi, Adi. I could drink the air, unfurl my voice, fling it across the huge gold disc, the sky. I can see the sun. I'm climbing up and out and wide and free. I don't know how it's happened, but I am free. Oh, thank you. Thank you, trees. Your great wise histories, your papers coarse and shiny, thick, Deep green leaves block out the painful world. I'm dreaming I'm held now by the heavens, held up high. My eye is winging wide across the light to where the border of Scotland lies. And there, that cloud there, he's sailing. Sail to France and say hello to all my memories from me. Down here, a captive, journey well. Your road is yours. You're free in air. No queen can you be subject to up there. In his hands and in his full power, I put my son, my honor, and my life. My country, my subjects, my soul, all subdued to him and have no other will for my scope which, without deceit, I will follow in spite of all envy that may ensue. For I have 
no other desire but to make him perceive my faithfulness. For storm or fair weather that may come, never will it change dwelling or place. Shortly, I shall give my truth, such proof, that he shall know my constancy without fiction, not by my weeping or feigned obedience as others have done, but by other experience. Are you leaving? Before you do, you could at least release my heart from its uncertainty. You see, in prison, you have me confined. No news gets through. This prison is my world. It's been a month, and a long month, since I was taken by surprise by 40 men, commissioners, who rushed into this prison and set up court completely unannounced. I had no lawyer, but they made me answer their formal charges their words bristling like traps. I was in shock, could barely speak, but I, from memory, replied as best I could. Then, like ghosts, they were gone. Since that day, nothing. Silence. Now, I look into your eyes. Is my fate there? Who won the vote? My friends or enemies? And should I live in fear or in hope? I breathe the air inside an English prison. In what ways do these laws help me in here? I'm not from England. I don't know your laws. I'm not a citizen of this country. I am queen of a completely different state. Who is my peer? Kings and queens are my only peers. This letter asks her a great favour. I ask her for an audience in person. We've never met. I've never seen her face. The men that judged me, they were not my peers. No man in England shares my royal birth. I can't accept their judgment of my case. My only equal is Elizabeth. My only equal breathing England's air. Your queen alone is of my blood, my sex. To her alone, a sister, queen, and woman, can I speak freely. I ask her for a second favour, one inhuman to refuse. She took my crown, my freedom, and my life from me. Perhaps my head is next but not my soul. She cannot want my soul. And for some time, I have been asking for my basic right. I wish to practice my religion. My days are numbered now. I'm waiting for my death. Dundrennan, May 15th, 1568. 
to the high and mighty Princess Elizabeth. You are not ignorant, my dearest sister, of great part of my misfortunes, but these which induce me to write to you at present have happened too recently yet to have reached your ears. I must therefore acquaint you as briefly as I can that some of my subjects, whom I most confided in, and had raised to the highest pitch of honour, have taken up arms against me and treated me with the utmost indignity. By unexpected means, the almighty disposer of all things delivered me from cruel imprisonment I underwent. But I have since lost a battle in which most of those who preserved their loyal integrity fell before my eyes. I am now forced out of my kingdom and driven to such straits that, next to God, I have no hope but in your goodness. I beseech you, therefore, my dearest sister, that I may be conducted to your presence, that I may acquaint you with all my affairs. So she is strong, and I am weak. So be it. Let your tyrant queen use force, slaughter me to make her crown secure. That a queen's head could come off like anyone's is not a precedent I'd be keen to set. But if she murders me, the world will know she used brute force because she was scared of justice. And everything she hides behind her mask will be exposed. And it won't look good. It won't look like holiness or virginity or the law, but just like tyranny, which is what it is. crying. We should all rejoice. Rejoice because our grief is at an end. My chains all come apart. The prison gates lift up and my pure joyous soul soars free forever this time. There's no need to weep. We could have wept when under lock and key and made to suffer what no queen should suffer. But now death is a friend, holds out his hand, covers my shame with inky wings and offers peace. I feel the crown back on my head. The final moment lifts a human up no matter who they are or what they've done. If only I could hold my family, embrace them one last time. Instead, I'll die with strangers, circling crowds, and only your tears shed for me.
I stand at the edge of eternity. All my affairs on earth are set in order. The russet of the autumn and the rise of some great shimmering butter yellow tree. Laughter in sharp blue eyes. A dragonfly. All palaces, all signs written by his hand. I bid them and this heavy earth farewell. I know I go before the highest judge. I only wish my God had granted me a final Catholic service, my last rites. I'll die without the peace of my own church. There is no priest here, but as our Lord said, when two of you are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of you. What makes a priest? It is something inside, and with that thing within, you are my priest, as I am still your queen, despite a world that would count us merely as two mortal souls. I'll make my last confession to you now. I ask the queen to let my people leave England unharmed. If the queen will not allow me burial on consecrated ground, let my servant take my heart with her and bury it where it has been in France. I've told the truth. I am ready for eternity. The hand of the clock cuts swiftly through my final minutes and I have made my full confession. My early death redeems my early life. He's granting me atonement. In manus tuas domine confide spiritum meum. In manus tuas domine confide spiritum meum. In manus tuas domine confide spiritum meum. In manus tuas domine confide spiritum meum.
Hello, good evening and welcome to our interval feature. I'm delighted to be joined by Dame Sarah Connolly uh, to discuss, amongst other things, tonight's programme of words and music. Sarah, it's a great joy to have you here. Before we talk about the concert itself and the programme this evening, let's talk a little bit about you. Mm. You're in residence here Singer's in 1819. Singer's favourite subject. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, but Fricka in mm. London and in Madrid, this residency here, recitals all over the world. Mm. It's been a busy season. It has. I've tried to keep the repertoire um, with all my European recitals sort of interchangeable so that I'm not doing new repertoire for each concert. Um, but it's been a wonderful journey with Julia Strake um, over the uh, last couple of months. And it's a continuing journey because we're, we're, we're still in the middle of a, um, a group of recitals. And uh, yes, the Fricker was an extraordinary experience in Madrid as well. What a great city. Is. I love it. And Covent Garden as well. We yes, you it was very, very different productions. Um, uh, Keith Warner's production at the Royal Opera House was more of a sort of uh, very much a, an involved, detailed play. Uh, it could almost exist without the music in the sense that there's a, a real framework of, of, of in, in involvements and actions. Whereas Roberts is, is more stylized and it's, it's more about a big political issue, which is called the eco ring in that case. It's, it's, uh, the river Rhine is dried up at the beginning and uh, it's, it's all about how we waste things and waste life and, and, and there's, there's, it's much, a, much more of a clear um, story within a story there. And plans for next season, uh, roles coming up? I'm not allowed to say what I'm doing because the Opera House in question, English National Opera, has not announced itself okay. yet. So, so I'll forward, be in trouble if yes, I say we anything. We look forward very much to, <laughs> to hearing what's, what's in store. Yes. Let's get back to tonight and to, the, to what we heard in, in the first half of the programme. It's very much about women. It's men, um, men's male composers yes. take on women, but this is an exceptionally well-constructed programme of words and music. Yes. Let's talk through from, from yes. Zemlinski at the start. Yes, Zemlinski is an extraordinary composer. Um, I f of course, he orchestrated these songs, Indeed. and they are very different on the piano. Yeah, yes. And rather like Mahler's Ruckert leader, they, they work differently um, on the piano, and they should be performed slightly differently. Obviously, you know, you need to listen. Both singer and pianist need to know the Rooket orchestrations in order to incorporate some of that breadth and, and uh, drama. But there's something very intimate about the Zemlinsky songs. They really are like pulling in the focus just to look at the little details of who these uh, six women are. In fact, there's more than six. There's three in several of them. Indeed. And um, we, we open with three yes, sisters. Three sisters. Yes, three sisters. Um, that are looking for uh, knowledge, um, the future and the past, and then the city, the this, this, this state, the all-knowing state. I, I, I think of this song as the, them growing up, growing into womanhood. The state shows them that you are now a woman, and this is how this, they show them the present. And it's, it's, they are sort of little moral tales, if you little journeys of, of, of of women going through childhood to adulthood to wisdom to loss. Uh, there's one song about a, a woman who um, who loses her her way and the man comes back to her apartment and kills her. Um, and then the final story is the extraordinary one of the queen um, who meets this strange woman outside of the castle walls. And the king says to her, who is this person? It's quite aggressive the way Tsemlinski sets it. Vorhin gehst du, why are you going? Where are you going? Don't you know who this person is? And it's quite spiky, the music. And she's, she just disappears without a word into the woman's arms. And they sort of fling each other's arms around each other and walk off. And that's the end and leave everyone standing. And I think it's, it is humorous. It's, it's, it's very dry. It's sort of Bertolt Brecht. Very cut viol actually in, in, the, in the treatment of the harmony in the piano. We end up in the second half of tonight's programme with, uh, from the diary of Virginia Woolf mm. and two exceptional women, one who in the end took her own life yes. and one whose life was taken from her yes. by the executioner. Let's, yes. let's talk a little bit about uh, 
from Virginia Woolf, mm. Dominic Argento, recently deceased. Yes. Pulitzer Prize winning, 1975, yes. written very much for Janet Baker, yes. but he, he says that, that he wrote it in such a way, it's about Virginia Woolf and for any great artist yes. to step in. Right, well, stepping into Dame Janet's shoes is always a big deal. Um, and I've been listening to her sing them all week, um, and it is a really glorious experience because she, she and Martin Isep spend so much time on the flexibility, on the words, and, and just they, they don't rush anything. Um, it's all so clear and heartfelt. But I get the feeling with these songs that they are less about... Um, showing emotion, they're just about information actually, they're just about, I feel like myself more as a narrator. But it's a very intimate private world, these are yes. exceptionally private yes, diaries. but they are not, I'm, it's not like I'm, in the Mary Stewart songs, I have to be Mary, yes. I, uh, they're very much first person, I, ich. Yeah. Whereas these, while they are Virginia Woolf's words, they're, they're her written words. Um, they are in the diary, and they are spoken, and I'm speaking them for her. But with Mary's, they were Indeed. the words that were reported that she said before she died. So I feel there's one slight remove with the Virginia Woolf songs, which is why I treat them more as reading the diary myself. Of course, there are moments when it gets very intimate, her feelings about, um, is there going to be a tomorrow, mm. you know? Uh, her mental health, her yeah, battle yes, with depression, yes, that it's comes very out. Clear. In fact, these songs are very, um, are very special with regards to the, the treatment of, of her state of mind. Yes. Uh, they're quite spare when they need to be. Indeed. They're not too... Um, they do, Dominic Argento's music doesn't interfere with the words. But, that, but the piano out. part is exceptional because it, yeah. it brings you into that world, that world of Virginia Woolf as well. Yes, uh, and also the, where she is. Uh, yes. Sometimes she's in these in, in Poets Corner, Westminster Abbey, for her Hardy's funeral, and you get a sense of majesty with these great big bass notes in the left hand, and there's a sort of uh, irony, comic irony in that, because she's poking fun at, the, at all the people who conduct the funeral, and they look very pious, and she finds it quite yes. amusing. She's very anti-clergy, yes. very anti-religion, yes. that comes out. Yes, but it, it, in these songs, it's very dry humour. There's no anger there. It's sort of, the, there is anger where she, she doesn't like uh, um, the, her women's writing. You know, there's, there's a jibe at uh, the vicar. Indeed, uh, she calls, she's humbug, hum almost as if yes. he's, he's a fraud. Yes, and, um, there's a comment about women's writing, which, which might have been a quote from Hardy himself that Indeed. someone was reading. Yeah. She didn't know Hardy that well. No. Part of her father's circle, apparently. Yes, but it's, it's, a, it's a men's club, isn't it? Indeed. And, uh, you know, she was, she was in very much fighting for her voice. And okay. um, so she's sort of... It, there's a lot of sort of hard, funny irony in these songs. Yes, and she loved music. Yes, she did, and the Wigmore Hall. Indeed. And uh, some of the texts cover that. Absolutely. That, you know, she's attending a rehearsal during an air raid, I think. Well, let's talk about Kate Kennedy's mm. words for Emily Barrington. Yes. Well, um, it, I did these songs with Julius uh, a few years ago here, um, and I was just struck by the, the wonderful choices of text between the songs that take you on this journey to all the places she has visited and all the, all the people she knows and um, vignettes from her stories, from her books and her observations, particularly observe, observe is something that comes through her uh, songs that that is the most important aspect of a diarist Indeed. is and to be an observer. There's an interesting entry on Rome. Mm. Yes, she, she talks about the, the ladies in Rome and the, the, the difference Having between the tea, rich and the yes. poor and the black, wispy, wispy haired women um, who are a very different uh, kind of person to the well heeled um, British ladies, or not just British, but you know, European ladies. Um, but she notices that there's another life going on there that isn't, isn't in, of a parity, isn't the same. So she, uh, 
and again, Dominic Argento treats that, and it just almost takes the piano away to show the, the humility with which she's saying, isn't it a shame that, yes. that these poor women have nothing? Um, uh, so the, the piano writing is extraordinarily colorful and really supports her stories and yes. her um, observations. And, and the opportunities you're given throughout the cycle to cover, to colour words yes. and pauses mm. and emphasis. Yes, yes. It's really wonderful. Especially the menu at the end where she talks about uh, writing the word haddock down, gives yes. it its own sense of importance yes. <laughs> and, and that it, it wouldn't otherwise have. The, the, uh, the entry on the war. Yes. Gosh, is, that's an extraordinary yes. song. I've never heard an, I mean, it's Britain-like in places. Yes. Um, and these sort of reiterated high notes in the, in the piano are sort of, sort of trembles of fear almost, um, a sort of stab of, of fearful anticipation of what might happen at any time. Um, and and of also course her she, own there was huge fear, yes. probably amplified by her own, her own state of mind at yes, times. Yes, yes. It's almost like a sort of conscience, it's like a ringing bell um, in, in, the, in the piano part, which is, is literally like a sort of, uh, a stream of consciousness going on the whole time while we're singing about something else. The war, the war, the war, what will happen? So there's a, a real sense of anticipation and fear in that song. And the, the piano music is, is again, quite very spare. And when she talks about her parents, it's very warm yes. and full of lovely major sevenths and quite schmaltzy in, so in a lovely way. Argento said it's more about his parents because yes. he, he pointed out that her Clearly. parents were probably unlovable in, yes, in some ways. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, but, but that's clearly a very... Um, it stands out for being something that's very heartfelt in his writing, yes. We're going to talk about Schumann and Maria Stewart in a minute, but of course Dominic Argento was possibly influenced by Schumann in his choice of eight songs and a narrative through a woman's life. Exactly. For Virginia Woolf. Franny Bundleben as well, and, and here... The, the songs of Mary Stuart. Schumann was fascinated by all things Scottish as well, the, the Hochländisches Vegan Lied and all these Robert Burns um, poems. And I thought it was an interesting thing for this concert, knowing that we were um, going to pair it with the Dominic um, Argento songs, to have some words and music um, happening with the Mary Stuart songs. Mm -hmm. The Mary Stuart songs are five songs in quite solid home keys, E, A, G, and then A, E, G, and it just, those three songs, and whenever I've performed them, I thought, I think they're genius songs, I think they're extraordinary, and it, I thought, well, how, wouldn't it be interesting to have some texts in between that, um, where the Schiller play, which is basically the Schiller story, mm. that begins with her um, leaving, well, actually, the Schiller's play starts after she's left France, but principally the meeting with Elizabeth. Yes, but, but this, this is probably a, a fictional meeting. It's well, never, who knows? It, yes. <laughs> but yes, I think, I think um, certainly Schumann and Schiller are the two great, yes. great artists who beautifully demonstrate the possible, yes. probable not, but you never know, uh, meeting between the two great ladies. Um, wouldn't it be interesting to have a, a parallel, um, have the actor, whoever, and it's wonderful, Emily, who's fabulous, uh, reading the uh, excerpts from the Schiller play that are pertinent to the songs. Yes, kind of filling in gaps. Yes, yes. Um, because they are huge gaps in yes. the Mary Stuart songs. We yes. begin with her leaving France, clearly a young woman. Could be a memory, of course, yes. that she's having, but uh, as an older woman, but and then she's praying for the birth, for the safety of her son. Yes, indeed. Um, and then she's discussing uh, the, the, the situation that she's in, you know, this imprisonment. And, um, and then she decides to write a letter to Elizabeth and, you know, please believe me, I'm writing from my heart as sisters. Um, don't believe what you hear. Just listen to me and know I'm telling the truth. Um, and then the final um, songs, she's literally handing over her worldly goods to her servants, to her, and praying for some kind of salvation, mm -hmm. and that she's not viewed badly. 
by history. Indeed. And interestingly today, it's, it's even in today's sort of not particularly religious society in England, there's still a frisson. The Schiller play still comes around. People are still interested yes. in, the, in those two women. And they were interested women. in Schumann's time as yes, well, yes. which is possibly why there, there are gaps, because I think he assumed a public knowledge of, of, of the story. Exactly. Um, and this is the first time that I know of that these songs have had words in between. Indeed, yes. Um, well, certainly here. Yes, certainly here. And yes. I'm very grateful that you allowed it to happen, John. I really am, because I, I think... Um, Laura Tunbridge, I asked Laura, it was, we just had an interview about something else, the Oxford Leader Festival actually, and I said, I've had this idea that I want to bring in the Schiller um, excerpts from the Schiller play to complement the songs or to expand on the songs, um, especially in between um, each song. And she said, what a good idea. And I said, really, you think that would work? She said, oh yes, I'd love to be involved. So, and here we are. And here we are. And we've to all of us have reworked the text, and, and, but not much. And she's come up with some, you know, really special um, text. She comes in, Emily comes in as Clara, reading yes. a letter. And of course, the, these were given to Clara yes, as a Christmas present in 1852, That's right. which was a dreadful year it for was, Schumann. It yes. yes. He was, and, and so he was beginning to write again. So it's a big deal, these yes. songs. And they are extraordinarily stark, um, truthful, hard-hitting. Um, not easy to listen to, so I think with the, with the sense of having these words in between makes makes it a very complete um, dramatic experience. Um, and I do think, as a singer, we have to be very truthful with these songs, not too arty. Mm. Um, a sense of stepping back from it, but also engaging with the anger, with the uh, the fear, um, because they're very direct. Mm. and they're raw. Yes. Um, so I, I think this is a really interesting experiment. I'd be interested to know if people love it or hate it. You know, it's well, it's, it's exceptionally intelligent programming to, to put all of this together. Is that not a euphemism for, oh my God, this is, this is too difficult? No, it's no, not. <laughs> no, it's, it, I, it, it's, it's a wonderful concept. Thank you. It's, it's a week since International Women's Day. It's yes. a pity that we didn't yes. coincide with that in a way. Mm. And as I read through the text again this morning, things have improved for women. There's still work to be done. I'll say yes. But as it's, it's very much, um, we need to focus um, on equality. And also on, I mean, I'm not a fan of bashing men. Yes. I really think that's not the way forward. Um, I think we need to work collaboratively um, and men need to understand, obviously, the history of, of suppression and oppression. And I'm not, I'm talking about Europe, really, rather than any other countries. I would love it to be in the case, you know, in I Iran. Mm. Um, That's a bit harder, a bit oh, further down the I road. Think, I think, yeah. I look back at the Mary Stuart, the time of Mary Stuart, and think of the equality, the, the, the difficulty, irrespective of the two queens. But, you know, in everyday life, these women had, you know, weren't allowed to vote, weren't allowed to partake in daily life. Um, yes, they might have controlled the family and the household through their wits or through their skills, but you know, they need to have equal power, and today we're getting much closer to that. Well, Dame Sarah Connolly, thank you very much for this wonderful programme and for this very special celebration of women at well, Wigmore Hall. Great, great thrilled to be here as always. Thank you, John.
diary habit has come to life at Charleston. Bunny sat up late on the old year's night writing, and Duncan came back with a ledger bought in Lamb's Conduit Street. The sad thing is, we don't trust each other to read our books. They lie like vast consciences in our most secret drawers. This attempt at a diary is begun on the impulse given by the discovery in a wooden box in my cupboard of an old volume kept years ago and still able to make us laugh. This, therefore, will follow that plan, written after tea, written indiscreetly, and, by the way, note here that Leonard has promised to add his page when he has something to say. His modesty is to be overcome. There was a great downpour this morning. I am sure however many years I keep this diary, I shall never find a winter to beat this. It seems to have lost all self-control. I caused some slight argument with Leonard this morning by trying to cook my breakfast in bed. 
It is, after all, January, and the temperature nothing short of Arctic. I believe that the good sense of the proceeding will make it prevail, that is, if I can dispose of the eggshells. <laughs> Only the other day, everyone was going to hear Bertie Russell lecture, but I preferred to hear the songsters in Trafalgar Square. The steps of the column were built up, pyramid fashion, with elderly, respectable householders grasping sheets of music, which they rendered in time to a conductor on a chair beneath, with great precision. It was lifeboat day, and the elderly people were singing sailors' shanties and tom bowling. This seemed to me a very amusing and instructive spectacle, and being famished for music, I could not get past but stood and felt thrilled with an absurd visionary excitement and then walked over Hungerford Bridge making up stories. When I went home, I found a barrel organ was playing in the middle of the square. I bought six bundles of coloured tapers. The stir and colour and cheapness pleased me to the depths of my heart. The two episodes led me to think. In fact, I have written an article about street music, so you can imagine what a flutter is going through the musical world. It's probably reached Dresden. I will treat you to a flavour of some of them, as I have every confidence that my remarks will revolutionise the whole future of music. Street musicians are counted a nuisance by the candid dwellers in most London squares, and they have taken the trouble to emblazon this terse bit of musical criticism upon a board which bears other regulations for the peace and propriety of the square. No artist, however, pays the least attention to criticism, and the artist of the street is properly scornful of the judgment of the British public. It is remarkable that, in spite of such discouragement, as I have noticed, enforced on occasion by a British policeman, the vagrant musician is, if anything, on the increase. The German band gives a weekly concert as regularly as the Queen's Hall Orchestra. The Italian organ grinders are as faithful to their audience and reappear punctually on the same platform. And in addition to these recognised masters, every street has an occasional visit from some wandering star. I have seen violinists who were obviously using their instrument to express something in their own hearts as they swayed by the curb in Fleet Street. And the copper, though rags make it acceptable, was, as it is to all who love their work, a perfectly incongruous payment. Indeed, I once followed a disreputable old man who, with eyes shut so he might better perceive the melodies of his soul, literally played himself from Kensington to Knightsbridge, in a trance of musical ecstasy from which a coin would have been a disagreeable awakening. <laughs> it is indeed impossible not to respect anyone who has a god like this within them. For music that takes possession of the soul so that nakedness and hunger are forgotten must be divine in nature. Those strange heathens who do the bidding of no man and are inspired by a voice that is other than human in their ears are not really as other people, but are either gods themselves or their priests and prophets upon earth. Certainly, I should be inclined to ascribe some divine origin to musicians at any rate, and it is probably some suspicion of this kind that drives us to persecute them as we do. Instead of libraries, philanthropists would bestow free music upon the poor so that at each street corner the melodies of Beethoven and Brahms and Mu Mozart could be heard. It is probable that all crime and quarrelling would soon be unknown and the work of the hand and the thoughts of the mind would flow melodiously in obedience to the laws of music. It would then be a crime to account street musicians or anyone who interprets the voice of the God as other than a holy man, and our lives would pass from dawn to sunset to the sound of music.
Another perfect country day, completely without cloud or wind, as if settled forever. Watched a dog herding sheep, rooks beginning to fly over the trees, both morning and evening, sometimes with starlings. I saw a clouded yellow in the garden, a very deep yellow, the first for a long time. Clouds brewed over the sea, and it began to rain at tea. Then great thunderclaps and lightning, difficult to distinguish thunder from guns. I walked home over the downs, red sky over the sea, woods almost as thin as winter, very little color in them. German prisoners walked across the field. They are now helping on this farm. Corn over the road, still standing in shocks, uncarted. Servants stayed at Charleston all night, say that there was gunfire as well as thunder. When I am back in London, I wander about the dusky streets in Hoburn and Bloomsbury for hours. The things one sees and guesses at, the tumult and riot and busyness of it all. Crowded streets are the only places, too, that ever make me what in the case if another one might call think. Now I have to decide whether I shall go up again to a party at Gordon Square where the Aranyi sisters are giving a violin and piano recital. On the one hand, I shirk the dressing and the journey. On the other, I know that with the first chink of light in the hall and chatter of voices, I should become intoxicated and determined that life held nothing comparable to a party. I should see beautiful people and get a sensation of being on the highest crest of the biggest wave, right in the centre and swim of things. On the third and final hand, the evenings reading by the fire here, reading Michelet and the Idiot, and smoking and talking to Leonard in what stands for slippers and dressing gown, are heavenly too. And as he won't urge me to go, I know very well I shan't. Besides, there is vanity. I have no clothes to go in. It isn't as if I'm starved of music. Every afternoon for a week, I've been up to the Aeolian Hall, taken my seat right at the back, put my bag on the floor, and listened to Beethoven quartets. Do I dare say listened? Well, it, if one gets a lot of pleasure, really divine pleasure, and knows the tunes, and only occasionally thinks of other things, surely I may say listened. One of the things I decided as I listened 
was that all descriptions of music are worthless and rather unpleasant. They are apt to be hysterical and to say things that people will be ashamed of having said afterwards. Sir Henry Newbolt confessed to me that music, especially the music of strings, moves the fount of poetry in him. And something always comes of a concert. Something will come this afternoon, he assured me as a priest foretelling a miracle or a conjurer producing a rabbit. Today they were playing Haydn, Mozart, Brandenburg Concerto and The Unfinished. I dare say the playing wasn't very good, but the stream of melody was divine. It struck me what an odd thing it was. This little box of pure beauty set down right in the middle of London streets and the people, all so ordinary, crowding to hear as if they weren't ordinary at all or had the ambition for something better. Opposite me was Bernard Shaw. There was Sir Claude Phillips, the art critic, Towards the end of the concert, when the lights were still low, the old goat, Sir Claude, only kept by the tightness of his white waistcoat from gushing entrails all over the carpet, <laughs> took it in his head to leave. The whole audience saw him move down the gangway. Suddenly he disappeared. There was a sound of coal sacks bounding and rebounding, then dead silence. He had fallen down a complete set of stairs, <laughs> but is not hurt. Mr. Hewitt, you bow to me. It was evident at once that Miss Allen was the only one of them who had a thoroughly sound knowledge of the figures of the dance. After the Lancers, there was a waltz. After the waltz, a polka. And then a terrible thing happened. The music, which had been sounding regularly with five minute pauses, 
stopped suddenly. The lady with the great dark eyes began to swathe her violin in silk, and the gentleman placed his horn carefully in its case. They were surrounded by couples imploring them in English, in French, in Spanish, for one more dance, one only. It's still early. But the old man at the piano merely exhibited his watch and shook his head. He turned up the collar of his coat and produced a red silk muffler which completely dashed his festive appearance. Strange as it seemed, the musicians were pale and heavy-eyed. They looked bored and prosaic as if the summit of their desire was cold meat and beer succeeded immediately by bed. Rachel was one of those who had begged them to continue. When they refused, she began turning over the sheets of dance music which lay upon the piano. The pieces were generally bound in coloured covers with pictures on them of romantic scenes. Gondoliers astride on the crescent of the moon, nuns peering through the bars of a convent window, or young women with their hair down, pointing a gun at the stars. She remembered that the general effect of the music to which they had danced so gaily was one of passionate regret for dead love and the innocent years of youth. Dreadful sorrows had always separated the dancers from their past happiness. No wonder they get sick of playing stuff like this, she remarked, reading a bar or two. They're really hymn tunes played very fast with bits out of Wagner and Beethoven. <laughs> Do you play? Would you play? Anything so long as we can dance to it. From all sides, her gift for playing the piano was insisted upon and she had to consent. As very soon she had played the only pieces of dance music she could remember, she went on to play an air from a sonata by Mozart. But that's not a dance said someone, pausing by the piano. It is, she replied, emphatically nodding her head. Invent the steps. Sure of her melody, she marked the rhythm boldly so as to simplify the way. Helen caught the idea, seized Miss Allen by the arm and whirled around the room, now curtsying, now spinning about, now tripping this way and that with a child skipping through a meadow. This is the dance for people who don't know how to dance, she cried. The tune changed to a minuet. St. John hopped with incredible swiftness, first on his left leg, then on his right. The tune flowed melodiously. Hewitt, swaying his arms and holding out the tails of his coat, swam down the room in an imitation of the voluptuous, dreamy dance of an Indian maiden dancing before her Raja. The tune marched and Miss Allen advanced with skirts extended and bowed profoundly to the engaged pair. Once their feet fell in with the rhythm, they showed a complete lack of self-consciousness. From Mozart, Rachel passed without stopping to old English hunting songs, carols and hymn tunes, for, as she had observed, any good tunes with a little management became a tune one could dance to. By degrees, every person in the room was tripping and turning in pairs or alone. Now for the great round dance, Hewitt shouted. Instantly, a gigantic circle was formed. The dancers holding hands and shouting out, Do you ken John Peel? As they swung faster and faster and faster until the strain was too great and one link in the chain, Mrs. Thornbury, gave way and the rest went flying across the room in all directions to land upon the floor or the chairs or in each other's arms, as seemed most convenient. Rachel went on playing to herself. From John Peel, she passed to Bark, who was at this time the subject of her intense enthusiasm. As the dancers listened, their nerves were quietened. The heat, soreness of their lips, the result of incessant talking and laughing, was smoothed away. They sat very still, as if they saw a building with spaces and columns succeeding each other, rising in the empty space. Then they began to see themselves and their lives and the whole of human life advancing very nobly under the direction of the music. 
they felt themselves ennobled. And when Rachel stopped playing, they desired nothing but sleep. Susan rose. I think this has been the happiest night of my life, she exclaimed. I do adore music, she said as she thanked Rachel. It just seems to say all the things one can't say oneself. Rachel gave a nervous little laugh and looked from one to another with great benignity, as though she would like to say something but could not find the words to express it. Everyone's been so kind, so very kind, she said. Then she too went to bed.
such interesting and great artists we surround ourselves with. Do you remember I mentioned the composer Ethel Smythe? Well, she has descended upon us like a wolf on the fold in purple and gold, terrifically strident and enthusiastic. I like her. She is as shabby as a washerwoman and shouts and sings. My dear Ethel, if only I weren't a writer, perhaps I could thank you and praise you and admire you perfectly simply and expressively and say in one word what I felt about the concert yesterday. As it is, an image forms in my mind, a quick-set briar hedge, innumerably intricate and spiky and thorned. In the centre burns a rose. Miraculously, the rose is you, flushed pink, wearing pearls. The thorn hedge is the music, and I have to break my way through violins, flutes, cymbals, voices to this red burning centre. Now, I admit that this has nothing to do with musical criticism. It is only what I felt as I sat on my silver-winged chair on the slippery floor yesterday. I am enthralled that you, the dominant and superb, should have this tremor and vibration of fire in you. Violins flickering, flutes purring. The image is of a winter hedge. That you should be able to create this world from your center. Perhaps I was not thinking of the music, but of all the loves and ages you have been through. That's what I call living. That's the quality I would give my eyes to possess. Of course, in my furtive and sidelong way, being like a flatfish with eyes not in the usual place, I had read a good deal of this years ago in your books, and now I begin to read it and other oddities and revelations too in your music. It will take a long time, not merely because I am so musically feeble, but because all my faculties are so industriously bringing in news of so many Ethels at the same moment.
we have now finally reached Germany. Greetings from Bayreuth. I am so bewildered with operas. We heard Parsifal yesterday, a very mysterious, emotional work. There is no love in it. It is more religious than anything. People dress in half mourning and you are hissed if you try to clap. As the emotions are all abstract, I mean, not between men and women, the effect is very much diffused and peaceful on the whole. Between the acts, one goes and sits in a field and watches a man hoeing turnips. The audience is very dowdy and the look of the house is drab. One has hardly any room for one's knees and it is very intense. I think earnest people only go. Germans, for the most part, in sacks with symbolical braid. But the opera itself is the most remarkable work, sliding from music to words almost imperceptibly. It leaves me feeling within a space of tears. Back in London again, and I am now writing nonsense because the pianola is playing with extreme brilliance and precision in the next room. Really, it is a wonderful machine, beyond a machine, in that it lets your own soul flow through. Marjorie Strachey, or Gumbo, as she is known, is seated at the piano dressed in a tight green jersey, which makes her resemble the lean cat in the advertisement, singing O oh, Dolce Amore to her own accompaniment. The accompaniment ends, she flings her hands up and gives vent to a passionate shriek, crashes her hands down again and goes on. A dry yellow skin has formed around her lips owing to her having a fried egg for breakfast. <laughs> a fresh lot of tunes came today, chosen by Adrian and a very mixed set. Bach and Schumann and the Washington Post and the Dead March in Saul, Pinafore and the Messiah. We find the difference in quality a very good thing because all our servants sit beneath the drawing room window all the evening while we play. And by experiment, we have discovered that if we play dance music, all their crossnesses vanish and the whole room rings with their shrieks. And then we tame them down so sentimentally with Saul or boredom with Schumann on the whole, their silence is a most desirable thing. Things in London are much the same as usual. A good deal of love, spite, art gossip and opera. By this morning's post, I got a card with musical hieroglyphs halfway through breakfast. I sang my song to keep myself in spirits and saw it as though in a mirror before me, mocking me. I at once changed my tune and sang the second song, which no one knows. Tell that chipmunk Clive Bell his malice is thwarted. I sang for half an hour and all the house crouched on the step to listen.
Oh, this war. We went to a concert at the Queen's Hall in the afternoon. Considering that my ears have been pure music for some weeks, I think patriotism is a base emotion. By this, I mean, I am writing in haste, expecting Flora to dinner, that they played a national anthem and a hymn, and all I could feel was the entire absence of emotion in myself and everyone else. If the British spoke openly about WCs and population, then they might be stirred by universal emotions. As it is, an appeal to feel together is hopelessly muddled by intervening greatcoats and fur coats. I begin to loathe my kind, principally from looking at their faces in the tube. Really, raw red beef and silver herrings give me more pleasure to look upon. To take our minds off politics, we all chatter hard about music. Eddie explains about 19th century music and rhetoric. Duncan attacks, but seldom uses the word he means, sometimes has to unbutton his waistcoat while endeavouring. Very interesting. We compare movies and operas but I do so fervently believe that the only thing in this world is music, music and books and one or two pictures. I am going to found a colony where there shall be no marrying unless you happen to fall in love with a symphony of Beethoven. No human element at all, except what comes through art. Nothing but ideal peace and endless meditation. I do believe that beautiful writing is like music, often. The wrong notes and discords and barbarities that one hears generally and makes, too. I have been having a debauch of music and hearing certain notes to which I could be wed. Pure, simple notes smooth from all passion and frailty 
and flawless as gems. That means so much to me and so little to you. Now, do you know that sound has shape and colour and texture as well? I read then and feel beauty swell like ripe fruit within my palm. I hear music woven from the azure skeins of air and gazing into deep pools, I see youth and melancholy walking hand in hand. It is certain that you can carry away nothing that can be of service to you in your day's work from listening to music, but a musician is not merely a useful creature. To many, I believe, he is the most dangerous of the whole tribe of artists. He is the minister of the wildest of all the gods, who has not yet learned to speak in a human voice or to convey to the mind the likeness of human things. It is because music incites within us something that is wild and inhuman like itself, a spirit that we would willingly stamp out and forget, that we are distrustful of musicians and loath to put ourselves under their power. In spite of all that we have done to repress music, it has a power over us still, whenever we give ourselves up to its sway, that no picture, however fair, or words, however stately, can approach. The strange sight of a room full of civilised people moving in rhythmic motion at the command of a band of musicians is one to which we have grown accustomed. But it may be that someday it will suggest the vast possibilities that lie within the power of rhythm. And the whole of our life will be revolutionised, as it was when man first realised the power of steam. Style is a very simple matter. It is all rhythm. Once you get that, you can't use the wrong words. But, on the other hand, here I am, sitting after half the morning, crammed with ideas and visions and so on, and I can't dislodge them for lack of the right rhythm. Now, this is very profound, what rhythm is, and goes far deeper than words. A sight, an emotion, creates this wave in the mind long before it makes words to fit it. And in writing, one has to recapture this and set this working, which has nothing to do with words. And then as it breaks and tumbles in the mind, it makes words to fit it. I think then that my difficulty is that I am writing to a rhythm and not to a plot. Does this convey anything? And thus, though the rhythmical is more natural to me than the narrative, it is completely opposed to the tradition of fiction. And I am casting about all the time for some rope to throw the reader.
Strange how old traditions, so long buried as one thinks, suddenly crop up again. At Hyde Park Gate, we used to set apart Sunday morning for cleaning the silver table. Here I find myself keeping Sunday morning for odd jobs. Typewriting it was today, and tidying the room, and doing accounts, which are very complicated this week. I have three little bags of coppers, which each owe each other something. Shall I say nothing happened today, as we used to do in our diaries when they were beginning to die? It wouldn't be true. The day is rather like a leafless tree. There were all sorts of colours in it, if you look closely, but the outline is bare enough. I drove on top of a bus from Oxford Street to Victoria Station and observed how the passengers were watching the spectacle. The same sense of interest and mute attention shown as in the dress circle of a pageant. A spring night, blue sky with a smoke mist over the houses. The shops were still lit, but not the lamps, so there were bars of light all down the streets and in Bond Street, I was at a loss to account for a great chandelier of light at the end of the street. But it proved to be several shop windows jutting out into the road with lights on different tiers. Then at Hyde Park Corner, the searchlight rays out across the blue, part of a pageant on a stage where all has been wonderfully muted down. The gentleness of the scene was what impressed me. A twilight view of London. Houses very large and looking stately. Now and then, someone, as the moon came into view, remarked upon the chance for an air raid. We escaped, though, a cloud rising towards night. We had thunder last night, but not very tremendous only enough to spoil the promenade concert to which we were listening. Odd. There was a crack of lightning, and instantly Mozart went zigzag too. Modern life is a very complicated affair. Why not some sudden revelation of the meaning of everything one night? I think it could happen. Coming back last night, I thought, owing to civilization, I, who am now cold, wet, and hungry, can be warm and satisfied and listening to a Mozart quartet in 15 minutes. And so I was. <laughs> 